see you all here today. We are back in the third chapter of Genesis today. Uh, I brazenly thought we'd get through the whole third chapter last week. I, ha I had only five slides left, but it would have taken another hour. So I cut it down, and now we're going to go over the rest of chapter five. Today's highlight scripture is Genesis 3.15, which you might know it as the proto evangelism and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel uh, tremendous grace shown right here in chapter 3 in Genesis before anything happens um, let's pray father thank you for this time together we pray that as we look into your word that you might make us thirsty that you might give us a willing mind and a willing heart to hear your word maybe fresh for the first time. And I pray that you might inspire us by what you have done. Help us, Lord, to see great and wonderful things in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we look to Genesis chapter 3, just to recap what we've been going over, we saw all the days of creation the first six days of creation and the seventh day when God rested. We began the rest in, in two. We leave them off in chapter two. Everything is fine and bright and lovely and Adam and Eve are off to a good start, put in a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, and everything seems to be wonderful. And then everything changes. He, Adam names the animals and he finally comes to Eve and he, he comes to the woman. He says, you are woman because you've come out of man. And he names her because he's on a naming streak. And then they get married. The father of the bride, being God himself, gives her away to Adam. And he says, this is now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. The four principles of marriage. There's the leaving part, where you leave your family. There's the cleaving part, where with energy and effort, and sacrifice, you pursue the person that you're married to. You guys got that, right? Because it's, it's a real easy thing to lose a relationship if you don't invest in it. Number three, they became one flesh, and it's much more than the physical union coming together. Everything is common. The house is common. Your debts are in common. Your family's in common. Uh, it's not mine and yours. It's ours, right? You guys got all that. That's so great. And they were both naked and unashamed. They were completely open and honest. There was full disclosure, if you will, and there were no secrets. There were no lies. There was no little secret life going on over here. And that's what it is to be married. It means to completely give yourself over to someone else and for that person to completely give themselves over to you. Make sense? Good. You've heard this before. So last week, we went over... The tempter, who we were introduced to without even having a past or an understanding, and how this snake, this serpent, the Nakash, would come and speak to Eve and tempt her. There was the, the lie that he told her and the ultimate fall of all of mankind, Eve first and Adam second. And then the confrontation where God shows up and confronts them, the consequences of what happens, and now we are left to live that way in a broken state in a fallen world. So I thought we would get through all of that last week. We did not. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field in which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? My goodness, he's so restrictive. He won't let you have every tree. Gee, don't you deserve it? And cutting, undercutting what God told them to do. And then the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the fruit which is in the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, or you will die. We saw that she was misinformed about some things. There was more than one tree in the middle. There were two. We saw that she didn't even know what their names were. I would want to know what those trees were. The knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. She didn't even know the names. So she's 
misinformed. And then she was told that she's not allowed to touch it. I don't know if Adam just said that to her or if she just inferred that touching the fruit was wrong. But anytime we add to God's word, we set ourselves up for failure, right? It's the makings of so many cults throughout the world, adding to God's word and saying, well, this is God's word, but let's add to it because we know better than him. And that's a, that's a real problem. So casting doubt and beginning to distrust. The serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die. That's a flat out lie, isn't it? And the day that she ate of it, she did die. Spiritually, she was separated from God and ultimately death was entering into the world and she ultimately died like every other person since. For God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He didn't tell her the whole truth, like some kind of a slick telemarketer. He told her if, that her eyes would be opened, that's true, and she would know good and evil, and that's true, but not like God. They would know good and evil because they participated in, they were now wearing evil. And they now know the difference between good and evil because good is what they lost. Evil is what they're stuck with. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, it was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. She took first when she saw that it was a desirable fruit, that it looked good and it was something that would make her wise. We see these three plays that Satan plays same thing he did with Jesus in the garden is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those three plays never have to be changed or expanded because they still work. So we talked about this last week. And the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. Well, they were naked before and now they're still naked. But now they have something to cover up, don't they? And they can't trust each other. And it's the same thing that happens to us when we're in sin. We begin to cover up, uh, you know, not exactly like Watergate, but, you know, we cover up and we try to pretend, you know, nothing to see here. And it separates us from one another. And, and that openness, that honesty, that full disclosure, that transparency just goes away. And they take fig leaves and put them together and they made themselves aprons, a good old King James word for that. I don't know if you've ever picked figs off of a fig tree but they tend to have little teeny cilli that grow on the leaves. It's like fiberglass. And if you go picking with short sleeve shirt on, you'll end up itching like crazy because it, it, these little pieces, these little shards get in your skin. So I couldn't think of a worse possible thing to put on the most tender nether regions of my body <laughs> than fig leaves. And yet that's what they do. And it's what happens when man tries to cover up his sin, when man tries to be good enough for God, when man has a religious, a religious uh, behavior without having a relationship, it's completely silly like trying to put fig leaves on. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves because that's what we do when we're in sin, we hide ourselves from God and from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now they know that they have done that which they should not have done and God shows up and instead of screaming and yelling and, and making a ruckus, the Lord, the, the language is that he walks up in the cool of the day. It's like he always did this and they always had communion and conversation with the Lord and he does this as a very natural thing. And they try to hide amongst the trees you know, it's a little like covering a child, covering their eyes and saying, you can't see me. <laughs> and the interesting thing is God knew exactly where they were. The Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, where are you? It's almost like Adam, do you know where you are? And God seeks them out like he still seeks us today. Because there are none who are righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks God. There are none who are righteous. It's God who seeks us, and we're the ones usually hiding and running away. Amen. And he asks him a question. He doesn't make an accusation. He says, where are you? Not the way I would have done it. I would have said, where are you? You know, I would have been looking to inflict some wrath. But God shows up with tender mercy. 
in the third chapter of Genesis. This is the Old Testament God that everybody's afraid of, right? And God says, where are you, Adam? And it's more of a question for him to understand than it is for God to find out where he is. And he said, well, I heard, you know, I heard you coming. I was naked, so I covered up and, and I hid. Then he asked another question. Who told you you were naked? He instantly knew he was naked because it's interesting how God has built into us this understanding that when we transgress his law, we know it. You might know it as a conscience. And then if you've come to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your savior, the Holy Spirit now comes upon you and comes to live inside of you, according to the scriptures. And now you have a nuclear powered conscience and there's no getting away with anything. I see, you know what I'm talking about. But he asked him, who told you you were naked? He knew because he was wearing evil and he knew it. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Do you see the tenderness of a brokenhearted father in this conversation? He's not accusing, he's not beating him up. He's asking him. And then the blame game began. The man said, the woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave to me the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Notice another question, not an accusation. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You get the idea that God is trying to elicit a confession. He's looking for contrition. He's looking for humility and finding none, finding people who just blame each other because people in sin, that's what you do when you want to hold on to it. You blame somebody else. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's you grew up poor. Maybe you had bad exposure and bad friends. Maybe you had a traumatic event that occurred to you. Maybe you're Irish. <laughs> Maybe you're Spanish. I'm Irish. Maybe you're Spanish. Maybe whatever. You've got an excuse. Just fill in the blank. It's my Italian temper. Hey. <laughs> There's no excuse. It's not even an explanation. It's an excuse. And so the blame game went on instead of taking full responsibility. So this week, we're going to move forward into the consequence. Verse 14 begins, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any, all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you will give forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree in which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it and all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken." For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we pick it up where he comes to Adam, says, did you eat the tree that I told you not to eat of? And he goes, well, the woman that you gave me, this defective product, she's the one who led me in. And then he goes to the woman and says, what is this that you have done? And she says, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And he goes right to the serpent and he begins and he says, because you've done this, you are more cursed than all cattle, more than any beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I want you to notice a couple of things. Judgment is pronounced on the serpent. Not just the devil himself who is behind the instrument, but also the instrument itself suffers. It's a rather interesting thing. The tool that Satan uses is cursed, and I find that to be a principle that God just 
doesn't give judgment to Satan or the devil himself, but also the tools that he uses end up becoming cursed as well. The serpent is not asked to speak. No confession or reconciliation is offered. It's a once and done with the devil and the angels. They make a choice once and that's it. And they have to live with that for eternity. You and I, unfortunately, live that way unless Jesus Christ comes into our life and changes us. But the angels only have one shot and he's blown it. And he's kind of the king of the hell there. It says that he will eat dust all the days of his life. And I, I, I used to have snakes. I had a 12-foot reticulate python in my house, along with various other snakes. So um, it kept people from breaking into my house. It, it, it kept from, you know, it kept me feeding it rabbits, which was interesting. So yeah, all the women really liked that idea. <laughs> But I understand that with snakes, uh, their tongue, when they flick their tongue out, you know, and they have uh, th th those two little teeny things that flick out, that's actually how they smell. That's their part of their olfactory nerve. When they pull that back in, they analyze everything that their tongue has touched in the way of air, uh, even to like one part per million they can sense if there's blood or uh, they also sense temperature. It's a lot of interesting things with snakes, but they actually have a dust pocket which collects dust. And I thought that was interesting. Since their tongue is their nose, that makes sense. But I think it means something a little more. And if we understand from the text, if you remember in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In Genesis 3.19, it says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Notice on either side of this passage, man is identified as dust. So if, if Satan is going to eat dust all the days of his life, who does that mean? That means you and me. We're his food, are we not? So maybe you never saw that. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. It means strife or warring or opposition and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's a rather interesting thing. There are going to be two seeds at war. It's a two-seed war. I can see it now. The seed, of, the seed of the devil is what? Mankind. Because now all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The seed of the woman, it's interesting because seed is always, the word is sperma. I'll let your mind go wild. That's seed. A woman doesn't have a seed but she will ultimately give birth to a male child. And this is all inferring a virgin birth. Jesus Christ is preached right here in chapter three of Genesis, that he would come from a virgin and he would be a savior. And he would be in opposition to the seed of the serpent, which is all of mankind. And he would come to save us. Isn't that awesome? This is what's called... The Proto-Evangelium, which is the first time the gospel is ever mentioned in the scripture, where there is a savior that is promised to come and deliver mankind. So along with all of the curses being given out, there's the promise that at one point, at some time, there would be deliverance that would be granted. This is uh, the word for bruise, by the way, that's used here, uh, which is shuft. It's to bruise, to crush, or to gape upon. So you have a heel and you have a head that are involved. It's interesting in Romans 16, 20, it says, and God, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. He's speaking to those who are in Rome and he's talking about the ultimate destruction of Rome and that whole structure, which comes not long after the writing of Romans. So whether it's bruised or crushed, depending on what narrative you have or what version of the Bible you have, it's the same effect. If you take a snake and you take your heel and you bash down on its head, 
it may bite you. But the snake certainly is going to suffer a much greater blow. This is the prophecy that Jesus would come, that that which touched the earth, which would be his body, would die, but he would defeat Satan ultimately. You will bruise his heel. In other words, that part that touches the earth would die. So we've got Satan ultimately being prophesied that his kingdom will come to an end, that there will be one who with the heel will destroy his power. Amen? Amen. The promise of a deliverer right in with the curse upon the snake. It says in Isaiah 53.10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed there's that word again, and prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's very interesting that many years later in Isaiah, Isaiah would use that very same word bruise or crush. It says it pleased the Lord to do that. You know why? Because he thought about you. He thought about me. It pleased God to have his son bruised or crushed because it would mean your salvation. That's the love of our God. It also says in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So if there's any question as to who it is who is going to stomp on the nakash, we have it right here that Jesus was the one who was bruised for us. And his body, that which touched the earth, died but it destroyed the power of Satan forever. And to the woman, he said, now it's time for her to understand what her punishment is for what she's done. The woman said, I will great, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. You notice that these curses are all a result of sin. It's not God making it happen. It's God telling them what would happen. Sometimes people think God's mean. It was all our doing. A beautiful natural process that God intended is now contaminated. The, the ministry of a woman largely is giving birth and having children, something I can't do regardless if I uh, called myself anything. <laughs> I identify as a St. Bernard. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> I can't give birth. But the woman can. And it says that as God is blessing her with more conception, that there will be pain now because of sin. Giving birth to sinners is a tough thing. The woman's unique ministry and identity is blessed with conception, but tainted with sin and shame. God said that they are going to continue. Now, it must have been a relief because she thought for sure she's dead. I took the fruit. I, he said, I'm going to die. That's it. I'm dead. I'm dead. It's over. But no, she's going to have children. And he's saying, you're going to have children, but it's going to be with pain now. It wasn't with pain before. And so now this wonderful ministry that God created, especially for the woman, that the man cannot share, regardless of whether you say, we're pregnant, I don't buy it. <laughs> She's pregnant, you guys are expecting. Let's be clear, sorry. And so that's what it looks like. And things will be coming out of your mouth that you never would have believed. It's all because of sin, men. Have some grace. And then she said, it is said to her that your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. How many of you ladies like that? That's what I thought. Not one hand. It's not that your desire will be for your husband. Oh, you want him. No. It's that your desire will be to be the husband. Your desire will be to take the wheel. As a result of sin, it will be a natural propensity for a wife to take control of her husband. The whole Homer Simpson thing. Subservient male. 
That is a natural tension that you will have in marriage. Can I get an amen? amen. Only a few of you agree. Okay. Your desire will be for your husband. It's interesting. The, the word for desire here is only used one other time in the Old Testament. And it's about when Cain is being tempted. And he said, sin wishes to have you, but you must rule over it. It's the same thing here. But he will rule over you, meaning the husband will be the head. In fact, he was from the beginning. If you remember, he was created first. And the second thing, he wasn't deceived he went into it willingly with his eyes wide open, which isn't any better, but it is different. And so wouldn't it be nice if we were back in the garden and it could be all okay like it was, but there will be strife in marriage now and the contamination of giving birth and having children, the primary ministry, uh, or, or I should say the, the, the select special ministry of a woman is now contaminated with sin. And then he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. Well, that doesn't seem fair. The woman has to bear it in her body. He's going to bear it in the earth. The earth's going to take the rap for him. Saying you shall not eat of it, the ground. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. The sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you turn to the ground. For from out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Because you listened to your wife. <laughs> and ate of the fruit, which I told you not to. Men, we cannot select our wives over God. As much as you love them, you got to select God over your wife. Amen? Amen. Got to keep that priority or things get very sloppy. God's unique ministry to the man is now polluted. Remember, before Eve even came, he put him in the garden to till and to keep it. And he told him, take charge of this stuff. Take care of it. Subvert it. Rule it. Right? I like all those words. Make it happen. Keep it clean. That was his job. And now the earth isn't going to produce fruit like it once did. They're no longer going to be just freely walking through and picking the fruit. You've got to go out into the field where there is no shade. And you're going to have to plow the ground. And there's going to be thorns and thistles infested in the ground. Men, that's all because of us. You don't like your job? It's your fault. For more than one reason. The curse of sin is not work. The curse of sin is that your work is really hard. And men, we're going to sweat. How many of you sweat? You, a few of you, huh? Okay. Just wanted to see if you were awake. Work is now toilsome and burdensome. It's the hardship of our work. The very thing that God gave us to do, our ministry, the, out in our field, wherever our field is, is now contaminated with sin. God's special blessing has been corrupted. There's going to be fruitlessness. By the way, that's what a thorn is. It's actually undeveloped fruit. It's something that could have been a flower or fruit, but it becomes a thorn. It's an interesting thing. Sweat and death are now earned. There's now degradation that comes, and we will die. Dust you are, and dust you will return, saying you will die. Now there is physical death that has come upon the earth, and now we have infected the entire earth, including the animals. Jesus, by the way, came to buy back the earth because we sold it out. I don't know if you're aware of that. I want you to notice some things in this passage. There's ground, thorns, thistles, sweat on your face. Interesting, Jesus came and wore a crown of thorns, did he not? That was his crown because he was buying back the earth. If you remember when he was in the garden and he sweat great drops of blood as they fell to the ground. It's an interesting thing. Jesus had to undo all of the curse and he did it with his very life. Jesus came to reverse the curse and he had to go through all of these things and he did it for you and me. In Revelation chapter 5, we're given a, a glimpse 
of time very quickly. And it says here, and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back. So this is a scroll. This is the title deed to the earth, by the way. It was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open a scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, and when the pra- which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll for, and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is Jesus taking the title deed to the earth and he has a right to do it and no one else does because he came and purchased the right to this fallen world with his very life. Isn't that precious? In verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the prospective curses were announced on the serpent, on the woman, and on the man so they know what's coming down the pike. And now on the heels of that, Adam says, I'm going to call you Eve. It's funny because he gave her a name already. Did you ever wonder about that? They already named her. He said, behold, you're a woman. You came out of men. And that was her identity. You're a piece of me. Woman. <laughs> it's interesting. Her name now is Chava, which means life giver. That's what Eve actually means. Life giver. Where did he come up with this idea? Well, I think it's an interesting thing because in the scriptures, whenever you have a name change, it's always a change of identity. It always means that something has changed. In fact, if you think through the scriptures, you probably can think of a couple of people that have had their names changed. God changes them, right? You think about Abram. He's now Abraham. There's a in there that's a hey, which is breath. It's actually spirit. But anyway, sorry. Abraham. There's Sarai, who's now Sarah, who has a hey in her name as well, which it's actually an infusion of spirit. Uh, anyway, there's Jacob, who means heel catcher. He becomes Israel, which means governed by God. And he gets that after a wrestling match as a trophy, by the way. He got his name changed by God. Simon, when Jesus met, met him, he says, you're Simon Barjona, you'll be called Peter. Peter means rock. So we called him Rocky. He got a new name instead of Simon. And then we have Saul, the apostle Saul, which Saul actually means sought after one. He takes on his Greek name, Paul, which means little one. Sorry, Paul, means little one. (laughs) Saul means sought after one. Ooh, ooh, get in line, Get, get get your signature copy of his photo. And he became Paul. So you see these name changes, which are interesting and significant. 
It's interesting in Isaiah 62, 2 says, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness, speaking of God, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. In Revelation 2, 17, and I will give him a white stone and on this stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who received it. Did you know you're going to get a new name? It's going to be on a white stone and nobody's going to know of it but you. So how are you going to call people? <coughs> hey, uh, <coughs> Revelation 3.12 says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven <coughs> from my God, and I will write on him my new name. You're going to not only have a white stone with a new name, you're going to have a new name written on you. Would it be a tattoo? You guys just aren't curious at all, are you? So why did he select the name Eve and give her a new name? Because Adam believes God that he will fulfill his promise. Remember he said, it'll be your seed and her seed, and he will come, and he'll stomp on the serpent and destroy the power of the devil, although that which touches him will have to die. Adam believes, and he says, Eve, you're going to be the mother of all living. He calls her the mother of all living because he has hope in the Messiah. Isn't that interesting? Adam shows faith. I think that's a wonderful thing. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 10 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, Adam doesn't see Eve as the perpetrator, the woman that you gave me. He now sees her as the mother of all living because the Messiah will come from her not from him. I think that's rather significant. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. A whole lot better than fig leaves, wouldn't you think? But it's an interesting thing. The only way that you're going to be able to get skin is if you kill an animal. So God has to kill some animals to clothe Adam and Eve. In chapter 3 of Genesis... God is setting down a precedent. The innocent die for the guilty. If the guilty don't die, someone has to pay. And they get covered. So their sin, which they were so embarrassed of, which they covered with fig leaves, God says, I have a better way. And it's with skin, which means the sacrifice of an animal. We just celebrated communion. Most people think it's a butcher house sort of way to remember Jesus Christ. And yet God had set it up all the way back in chapter 3. Fig leaves are not sufficient to cover our nakedness or our shame. Leviticus spells it out here in the law many years later through Moses. Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. God sets it out right away. This is a practice I want you guys to get in the, in the practice of. Why? Because this will cover over your sin. It won't eliminate it. Only Jesus can. And it's interesting because here, probably two animals had to be killed. Later on, we find out that an animal in, in Passover can be, can be killed and shared by a family. Later on, there's temple worship and there's a priest who's going to sacrifice just one for a nation. And then eventually Jesus comes and John sees him and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Went from two animals to one animal for a family, one animal for a nation, God's own son for all the world. And Hebrews 9.22 says, for according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no elimination of sin or covering of sin unless there is blood. Well, 
can't I just be a good person? No. There's an innocent that has to die for your sin, and his name was Jesus Christ. He's the only one who was worthy to open the scroll. He's the only one worthy to take our sin away. And in Passover, you remember in Exodus 12, 13, now the blood shall be for a sign on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, it will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All of these things were types and shadows that God was trying to share with us. So when Jesus comes, we would recognize him. Do you see that? Do you recognize that Jesus is the one, it's his blood that matters. It's the remembrance that we had this morning through communion. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. And while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we still rebelled and didn't want anything to do with him, he made a sacrifice available for us. And it's available for you today. If you don't know him personally as your savior, you can, you just have to ask him. It's simple. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, which is heaven, by the blood of Jesus and by the new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil, which, which is a curtain in the temple, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Amen. We can approach God with boldness, not because we're perfect, because none of us is. We can approach because Jesus shed his blood so that we might have life and renewed relationship with God that we walked away from in the garden a long time ago. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. There's an interesting Trinitarian wink to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Do you see, if we would have taken from the tree of life, we would have lived forever. We ate from the wrong tree, boys and girls, right? Yep. Wrong tree, eh, wrong. Why couldn't he just gotten from the other tree? But now that we ate from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, God protects us by keeping us away from the tree of life. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground in which he was taken. The Lord God says one of us, interesting. He's not talking to angels because the angels don't know evil at all. They don't know evil in, in the way that God knows evil because they do have a choice to do it. God can't lie and he can't commit evil. So it's interesting. So God says us, his very name Elohim is plural. And yet he speaks of one God, Elohim, God, three in one. So they're clothed with skins and they're now kept away from the tree so that they don't live that way forever in a fallen state. And aren't you glad? Like, an, I don't know, would that be the night of the living dead? Uh, what would that look like? But I just think of the mercy of our God that he kept us away from that tree so that we wouldn't live forever in that state. We would be in the same place as the demons and of Satan himself, which made once and done choice and it's done but we have a choice and I'm so glad that we still do. In Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men to die once, but after this, the judgment. It's interesting, it's the very first doctrine that gets challenged in the scripture is judgment. Remember, woman said, I can't, I can't eat from this tree, I can't touch it or I'll die. And Satan said, you shall surely not die. He challenged the doctrine of God's judgment upon sin. And people do it today. They, they pretend there's no place as hell or Sheol or some sort of an afterlife where uh, you'll have to pay for your sins or have to face God for the things that you've done. And it's a, n a nice, easy way to make yourself feel good until you have to face him. But it's the first doctrine that actually gets challenged. It's judgment. We see judgment rolled out. 
And so he drove the man out and he placed the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So man is exiled from the garden, so it's no more an easy, happy picnic, walking through, picking fruit, and enjoying uh, husband and wife together in perfect grace. And it's interesting, God places cherubim. By the way, these are super-duper angels. These are bad dudes, okay? One could take out 185,000 Assyrians in a night. You don't want to mess, you don't want to mess with these guys. And it's interesting because it says cherubim, which is plural. Why would God use two angels? Well, I think one angel is probably powerful enough to keep Adam and Eve out of the garden, right? Seem a little like overkill to you? But they're not the only ones that are out of the garden, are they? The Nekesh, the snake, the serpent. He would also have free reign to go to the tree of life. I don't know what would happen at that point. But see, if you want to if you want to fight the devil, you you put two angels. That'll do it. That'll make sure you're okay. Until the appropriate time, the tree of life would then be offered at another time. Ladies and gentlemen, the tree of life. The tree that Jesus hung on and died. That is the tree of life in which there is no protection against anyone coming to Christ. And if anyone comes to Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. The tree of life is now available and open to all of us. In John 6, 53 and 57, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Now, it's a very disgusting thing to think of this literally because he didn't mean it literally, regardless of what church you may have come from. Do you see, he's calling himself the tree that you come and eat from and you live forever. Jesus is the one that we need. He's the only one that can solve our sin problem. He's the only one who's able to open the title deed to the earth. He's the only one that has a right to you and me. We should give him everything, amen? 